morning, Ms. Mammon. SJC 10291, Mass Bay Transportation Authority versus Boston Commons Union. Good morning, Ms. Harris. <laughs> Good morning, members of the court. If it please the court, Mary Jo Harris for the MBTA in these consolidated cases. These cases present, we submit, important issues of public policy and management of a public agency, both in regards to how it manages its public fisc and the way it treats its employees. As the court is aware, these consolidated cases involve appeals from arbitrator awards uh, in two separate instances. First, with regard to the MBTA's decision to rescind an aged list, uh, the Spare Inspector case, and secondly, in its decision to uh, settle a dis an employment discrimination case, and in that settlement, um, providing the complainant in that case with uh, his original date of appointment when he was conditionally offered a date of appointment by the MBTA along with all of the contractual privileges that would have been attendant to that position but for the uh, unemployment at the dis allegedly discriminatory action that was taken. Are, are you going to start with the Spearman's, that, that one, or? If it please the court, I'd be I happy mean, whichever, to. I didn't know which, wh what, what order would you like to do them? Uh, actually, my thought was to address first one issue just to put it out of the way. Uh, one of the issues that my brother raises is that in the absence of a finding of discrimination, neither of these cases implicate public policy. And that's an issue that I think is germane to both cases and one with which we disagree. Um, I would refer to the opinions of this court um, in various consent decrees that have entered over the years since at least the there early was a 70s. Settlement. There was a settlement here, correct? Strike me. I'm there sorry? was a settlement. It was a settlement in one case uh, following a dis decision by the MCAD that probable cause had, uh, had been issued to, f to credit the allegations of the complainant. And in the spare inspector's cases, um, that action was taken after a review and entry of what we would term a, a consent agreement with the Attorney General's office. But the Attorney General didn't take any position at all with respect to the, the spare inspector's list. I mean, that wasn't one of the things that the Attorney General was concerned about when it did its, I guess, audit or review of MBTA practices, was it? The Attorney General's agreement looked at the practices that are implicated by the spare inspector's list, specifically the use of employees in a temporary capacity uh, for extended periods of time, years actually, that, uh, pen that by being temporary permanently blocked other employees from being able to compete for those positions. Uh, I, I, are you telling me this was a, a temporary position to be on the spare inspector's list? I thought that was a permanent position. That's our position is that the, tempor the spare inspector list, the, the, the folks who, who qualify and got placed on the spare inspector list were permanent bus operators. They took an examination that made them eligible to serve in a temporary capacity when vacancies arose, but they but served permanently. But then didn't they become, after they were spare inspectors, didn't they then become s inspectors? They were on an eligibility list for appointment as permanent inspectors, but they, I would they were, by Weren't they, in fact, the only eligible list? It is the only eligible list for inspectors. Though. Yes, so, so essentially MBTA's position is if you've got all of these people who there years going back, you can't is in, in essence have uh, any kind of diversity in the in, uh, when you actually get to inspectors, correct? That's, that's the gravamen. That's the, the, the broad stroke, Your Honor. Um, the MBTA's position is, well, twofold. First, that the use of the temporary list for, uh, for all time would essentially grant tenure to those people who tested and received a placement on that list, which I would point out is inconsistent, at least with the way civil service lists work in the Commonwealth. In uh, a, a decision of but this at court, at some point you do exhaust it. I mean well, you exhaust it either by resignation, death, or promotion. Correct. But for example, in the list that was created following the test issued in <coughs> 1999, there were seven people still on the, the uh, list from a test that had been given in 1994. So conceivably, one could take a test, get on this list, and remain on it forever. And by forever, we mean until someone resigns, dies, or otherwise leaves service. It is I in our position, uh, when one is eligible for appointment, that does not translate into tenure for that appointment, particularly where with the uh, permanent inspector list, there are other qualifications that need to be, uh, but other hurdles in addition to just the written exam. But, but you're not, I don't think, are you, you're, you're not questioning, and maybe it's even in the collective bargaining agreement, that the choices of permanent um, inspectors will be made from the list of spare inspectors, 
are you? I'm not challenging that. That's correct. Okay. What I'm, uh, my argument to the court is that the MBTA, under its inherent managerial rights, has the, uh, the unilateral right to determine the qualifications for positions that it well, fills well on a permanent for capacity. Spare inspectors. For spare inspectors, and I would submit for permanent inspectors. But after the 1995 amendment to Section 19 and its uh, transformation to Section mm -hmm. 25, the language changed so that collective bargaining covers uh, appoint, uh, not appointment, covers uh, promotion and transfer, right? Correct. So wouldn't this be, in effect, a promotion? from the list of spare inspectors to permanent inspectors? When the promotion is made, I would say that it is. Prior to the promotion being made, prior to the vacancy being filled on a permanent capacity, the MBTA has the right to determine what standards will be applicable for that promotional opportunity to become Correct, real. Correct, going forward. But going if you forward. have people who are in those positions, I mean, What's your answer to the argument that the uh, that that really is a demotion of those who are on that list? They have not been promoted from that list. They are eligible for promotion. The list, the exam to be uh, placed on that list, makes one eligible for going through the interview process for review of their of their prior disciplinary history, and then, and only then, is the uh, in the spare inspector eligible for promotion into the permanent inspector. Uh, capacity, just as if one is on a civil service list, one is entitled for consideration, but it does not vest until the vacancy occurs and the candidate is chosen. Correct. Ms. Harris, if one were on the eligibility list in 1994 or 5, whenever it was created, and the MBTA set new standards, could the people who were on the 1994 uh, list uh, reapply and be on the 1999 list? Yes. So that so the eligibility remains open. That's correct. So that if the MBTA wants to uh, increase the qualifications bec for whatever reasons, you know, to uh, because there've been perceived changes, they can reset the qualifications from your point of view, and then people can apply again. That's correct. But uh, but as I understood it, you you kept some number. Then you said to the rest, you can take the test again and and requalify, but you will always be behind those that we are grandfathering in. That's correct. And so, a and since this is made on, the appointments are made on a seniority basis, they're, 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 in, a, they're in a worse position, correct? Those that are testing and reapplying? Yeah. I would say that they are in the same position as one would be if one were on a civil service list and was not reached before the, 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 the list expired. In other words, that, uh, in, and I'm using the civil service analogy because you know, in those circumstances, a list exists for a period of time, and if one is not reached, if a vacancy does not occur while one is eligible, one has the opportunity to requalify and try again. But essentially, when you're competing for limited positions, uh, I would submit that there is no entitlement that you will be reached for that vacant position unless and until a vacancy occurs while you are in line on the list. B but you have a collective bargaining agreement that says appointments are going to be made by seniority, and they're going to be made from this list, right? So, well, I mean, it's this not is quite like civil service in that you've got an overlay of, of provisions of the collective bargaining agreement. And, and we have an overlay of the inherent management rights clause. And I think the way that that applies here is because the MBTA reviewed the way that uh, the spare inspector list was created from the 1999 exam. And they had that list, that, excuse me, that test reviewed by Scott Moriarty, who was involved in the original Castro v. Beecher consent decree cases, and according to his unrebutted testimony, there was a great disparity from the, the folks who were on that eligibility list from the 1990 exam being promoted into the position of permanent inspector. According to his testimony, there were up more than four standard deviations uh, from the feeder pool of bus operators who were eligible for the exam actually being reached for placement as permanent inspectors. And that, in addition to other deficiencies that were found in the creation and the security of the exam, led him to conclude that the exam itself was a deficient instrument. Now, did that change when the subsequent exam took place? The uh, results, the, the racial breakdown, if you will, of the, the new valid right. test did not change. But right. I would say. Same, same basic makeup before with the old test and the new test. That's correct. But I would well, still four standard deviations. Uh, I don't know if there is any evidence in the record about 
the deviations. I, I, I would have to defer on that. I don't believe that there was testimony to that point. But I would submit that uh, even if a test has the same or substantially the same results, if the test has an indicia of reliability, uh, there is. But I thought the, the reason why the first test was determined to be I don't know, unreliable, maybe that's the wrong word, is because there were four standard deviations. So you have a retest, a different test, there's four standard deviations. So that one's unreliable too. There it were a number of concerns the with the original test. One was that it incorporated disciplinary, um, disciplinary action, which right, the right. separately the MBTA with the Attorney General found was being administered in a racially disparate way. So it was incorporating uh, a number of elements. There were uh, concerns about the security of the exam, about incorporating this disciplinary action. Okay, and so the, whatever the, the criteria were, and I take it there was also a test? Correct. So there's, in the, the, the redo, there's also a test, but disciplinary <laughs> actions don't, aren't one of the factors? Are, are not being used in the same right. manner as they were in 1999. Okay, and That's you come correct. out the same result? Roughly the same result. Okay. That's correct. So why isn't that defective? Well, I think because, you know, an exam, so, so long as the exam has at least the indicia of having been created in a neutral manner and there is job relatedness attached to that exam, there is, for example, no job relatedness that can attach to using discriminatorily applied discipline. If that, if that discriminatory element is absent, then the exam becomes a, a neutral testing instrument even okay. if it does have an impact. St the statistical concerns can be rebutted so long as there is a finding that there's nothing else about the exam that is discriminatory. Could, could you explain just a, a little bit of background about the, the creation of this uh, list to begin with? Apparently, there was some conclusion drawn by the MBTA that minorities had been disciplined more frequently than white bus operators. Or more, more frequently or more severely, correct. And as a result, there was the, the need for a new list. Is that, is that right? That was one of the factors that was considered in determining that it, a new list needed to be created. That's correct. And then it, it, once the uh, conclusion was we need a new list, but we're going to keep 31 or so whatever the number is right. of the people on the old list, mm -hmm. even though those 31 were there and uh, had been identified, uh, although discrimination had occurred against minorities. Why, why keep 31? Uh, essentially, as I understand it, there was an operational need and a public safety need to have inspectors to, to fill in for vacancies, either anticipated or actual. And to do away with the list entirely would have led to a critical need not being fulfilled. So it was really just to maintain operations at a, a minimum safe level that there needed to be people eligible to step into those positions who have been trained. Excuse me. Does the record demonstrate on what basis the 30 were retained? It does not, Your Honor, to the best of my knowledge, other than that they were the top, uh, the top people on the list. They were the, the top in, in terms of number ranking one, two, three, that's four, correct. five. That's so, correct. so that is that's the basis on which that's they were retained. Correct. Okay. I take it there's no evidence in the record of any ul ulterior motive for creating this new list, other than concerns about discrimination, litigation, or claims. That's correct. That's correct. So, what what is the standard you're asking us to? Uh, except that when an employer in good faith fears that there is discrimination with regard to a uh, the, w the way in which it's uh, it's developing a list that according to the arbitrator was mandated by the the CBA that it may essentially violate the CBA in order to address that risk? Is that, is that, is, is the good faith test that you're asking us to apply? Well, I, I believe that the, uh, the case I would indicate that when there is a reasonable belief that there has been discrimination in the course of the operations of a public entity, and that can be shown by, um, by antecedent discrimination, a history of discrimination, which we allude to in our record, or any finding that approaches a probable cause determination by the relevant authorities that discrimination has occurred, which we have here in both of our cases. Uh, in WIC, we have the finding by the MCAD that probable cause existed to credit his allegations of discrimination. 
and in the spare inspector situation. We have the findings of the Attorney General um, that the use, among other things, of temporary appointments in a permanent capacity uh, constitute discriminatory actions that here, this employer, uh, acting under its inherent managerial rights clause, has the authority to correct those instances of prior discrimination, and may do so under its inherent managerial rights here to determine the standards for or eligibility for appointment to a permanent position, which is what we submit <coughs> is what occurred in the, uh, in the spare inspector section, and in WIC, uh, under its reserved managerial rights clause, as incorporated into the collective bargaining agreement to run its business in an appropriate manner. Uh, would you say an answer, following up on Justice Gans's question, that the that the ap ap appointment in and the settlement of are governed by the same good faith test or reasonable basis test? I would. Uh, is there a difference between good faith and reasonable basis? I, I would uh, suggest that the good faith or the reasonable basis must be uh, attendant to some sort of evi substantial evidence or evidence that would compel the conclusion, at least their prima facie case, of discrimination has been made. I do dispute that there needs to be a finding uh, following full litigation of discrimination before the MBTA can act to take corrective action. C could I just ask one more sure, question? Please. With respect to your relying on the Attorney General's, uh, the consent decree and, and, and um, I think it was his at the time, his uh, fi yes. finding that um, this the practice of having temporary positions hold and so you couldn't fill permanent positions. Isn't this a little different, though? I mean, there is a, there is a recognized position as spare inspector. Mm -hmm. These are bus drivers who, who are qualified to do this on an as-needed basis. I mean, that's different than holding a full-time position on a te temporary basis. I mean, I, I guess I'm, my question is, isn't there a distinction between what the Attorney General found was problematic and this particular uh, List? Well, uh, we submit that it's one and the same, that by having this list of temporary inspectors that is never revisited and that no one is, is even given the opportunity to test for, that individuals are permanently blocked from being put into the theater stream for promotion to permanent inspector. I, and I, I, I take it that the problem, just to follow up on Justice, from, from the MBTA's point of view, is that one could have spare inspectors and, and in the sense that they are bus drivers who are qualified to be inspectors, if they were not the cohort from which you drew into full-time inspectors, mm -hmm. th there wouldn't be a problem. In other words, when there was a full-time position open, if you went out and re-advertised and had a different test, then you could separate out the two. The, the problem is because there's a linkage between being a spare inspector and then when there's an opening, the automatic filling of that opening by from within the spare inspector pool. Am I correct? I, I would agree with the, the latter, but I would also say that the MBTA is concerned about giving only those opportunities to work in a temporary capacity, which does have a, a pay differential uh, t to benefit the spare inspector, uh, having a list that was exclusive in that it was created one time only and that no one else really uh, has a practical op opportunity uh, to enjoy those benefits would remain a concern. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Taylor. Good morning. Uh, let me begin by s trying to point out to the court where we agree. Well, let me ask you, speaking of agreement, did you enter into a settlement agreement? Concerning? Well, that's what I'm going to ask you. What did it concern? Did you at some point enter into a settlement agreement? There was a settlement agreement in 2000 uh -huh. to, uh, there, uh, to establish that the MBTA's rank order of the employees placed on the spare list would stand. There was a dispute between the parties as to whether employees should go onto the spare list if they met the minimum qualifications for the job in seniority order or by rank order according to the MBTA's evaluation of the employees. And the settlement agreement did not cover that issue? It did. Uh, it'll, it did? It, it, it granted the MBTA's position. Okay, so the MBTA persuaded the union that it should be able to rate people and put them in order on the spare list and did. So the people who were at the top of the spare list were people that the MBTA had selected to be at the top okay, of the spare list by agreement with well the union. Why now are you objecting to the settlement agreement? 
that the yes. settlement agreement was the creation of the spare list. Yeah. Okay. We did not, w once the MBTA, quote, blew up the list, which is the uh, colloquial term that was used, and took the bottom 30 or 40 people and canceled their positions on the list, the union did not agree with that. It grieved that on okay. behalf of those people who were removed. And the arbitrator found that that removal was a demotion. There's a fundamental issue of fact here. Can, can I just ask I you a question, Mr. Taylor, mm -hmm. so I understand. In the period after the 2000 um, uh, settlement agreement, was it possible for a new bus driver to become a spare inspector? Not until the MBTA decided to advertise spare inspector list uh, positions. At the beginning, the list had 200 names on it. No, no, I don't know why the MBTA put 200 names on the list. No, but, but, that was their management choice, and they ranked all of them. No, but my, my question is, could the MBTA have opened up the list? Opened up? No. But they could have created additional <coughs> spots at any time for new people to come in. But the contract is clear. But, but if Do they create, uh, hold on, I, I, I'm not sure that I quite understand you. They could, they could have new people on the list? Of course. At and the then At the bottom. No, At wait, the bottom. Well, the contract. But, but that's my problem. If the MBTA, if the settlement agreement with the MBTA rank order trumped, you know, in 2000, why wouldn't it slump in? Well, because once they enter the classification, then the contract governs. The contract says that an employee earns seniority in a classification beginning on the date that they enter. Now, when all of them enter at the same time, which is what happened in 2000, 200 or over 200 entered at the same time, then how do you decide who's, who goes? The union would have preferred that you decide by their overall seniority in the preceding classification. The MBTA wanted to rank order them. And uh, in the end, the union mm -hmm. went along. I, um, there's something else to understand that <coughs> I think wasn't stressed quite enough in the presentation that my sister made. Service as a spare is not merely for the purpose of waiting to become a full-time inspector. No, it's got a, as she said, it's got a pay differential and you get additional pay in between, correct? Yes, and as one works one's way up the list, more and more opportunities <coughs> come the way of the person to, to actually work as an inspector. And th that is uh, different responsibilities, different times of day, different days off, and more pay. So th these people who were ranked at the bottom of the list had waited four years creeping up the list until they had an opportunity, <coughs> and, then, and then the list was abolished. They were, they were very upset, as was the union. Now. I want to return to the point at which the union agrees with the MBTA and with its brief. There is no question that a collective bargaining must give way when the civil rights have been violated. There is no question that collective bargaining or in the position of the union must give way to remedy clear violation of the civil rights laws. Mr. Taylor, uh, well, do you want to finish or? No, no, please. My question is, okay, um, but if I could switch for a second to the WIC case. Certainly. Uh, is it your position that in order for your agreement to come into play, there needs to be a full litigation and adjudication that indeed discrimination <coughs> happened? I mean, isn't that going to stop in its tracks settlements? No. There are two ways that that can happen. One is, of course, there is a finding. And it could be by anyone. Now, I do not. I do not. Yes. I do not agree that the, uh, the probable cause is a finding. Okay. That is so not a contested so proceeding. <laughs> okay. I, I'm sorry, it's not a, I, in my view, it's not a contested proceeding in the same way as uh, a real, uh, I'm sorry, a more permanent adjudication, more formal adjudication. But it, uh, the other way uh, um, it, it would be if the union were involved. There is nothing wrong with the MBTA or MCAD coming to the union and saying, look, we've got a problem. Is something happened here, and and the uh, and, and we need your assistance to try Mr. to work Thompson, out a remedy. Mr. Taylor, the Wick case, if I go ahead, go ahead. All right, the Wick case, <laughs> in particular, lends itself to that kind of cooperative endeavor. In in the Wick case, there are plenty of ways to protect other employees against um, applications of seniority by Wick, 
or protect WIC against detrimental applications of seniority by other employees. As I understand it, uh, unless there is a finding after it, an adjudication, what you describe as clear violation of discrimination, unless there's a finding of discrimination, the only alternative that an employer has is to negotiate with the union. No, I do not agree with that. Okay. Uh, well, the only alternative is to negotiate with the union, maybe not negotiate, but certainly establish to the union that there has been a violation. And then the union is in an opportunity both to settle if they think a settlement should be appropriate or to participate in the remedy. And if they don't? Yeah, if, if the you union go, if you refuses? Go back, yeah. If oh. the union refuses? No, if, I, the, if the union disagrees, just says, I don't think that this is a clear violation. That's right. If the union disagrees, that would be a problem. And it would have to be either adjudicated or something else where would be Where in done. our law have we said that where discrimination is at issue that the employer has no remedy unless there's a negotiation with the union? No, there is nothing like that. But there is in Title VII and elsewhere the, the provision that says um, seniority provisions, legitimate seniority provisions will be honored. And when there has been a finding in court or uh, by an agency that there has been discrimination and the remedy will impact other employees, the union is involved. In fact, in federal court, there is a subsequent uh, remedial hearing in which the interests of the employees are represented and, uh, and ameliorated by the court. That's the role of the union. And now, how the union could be obstructionist, but if the union is obstructionist in a way that violates the law, the union is on the hook, yeah, too. That's in a class action. Uh, could be in an individual case. There's a subsequent remedial hearing before the court? Well, you're right. You're right. I, I, uh, I, I have not seen that. You're right. It would be a class could action. You, the spare you? inspectors, for example, might fall into that category. With but not, not Mr. Witt. Did, right. did the arbitrator reach a conclusion that the list, as previously constituted, likely reflected discriminatory practices? No. She held exactly the opposite. What did she? She had, she had testimony from Mr. Moriarty. She had the reports of the Attorney General. She had the report of a consultant that had been hired by the Attorney General to examine uh, all of the, now that's found. Where's that? It's found, uh, her decision on that score, on that point, is found in the appendix at uh, um, 230 to 232. And Judge Kottmeyer, uh, Justice Kottmeyer, I'm sorry, who reviewed her decision, um, came to the same conclusion uh, at uh, in page eight of her decision, which is at uh, uh, the appendix page 324. And, and both the arbitrator and the judge examined <coughs> that point carefully. <coughs> uh, of course, it, it is conceivable that the court might want to review a, a determination by an arbitrator or, of course, a judge that there had been no discrimination. But the point that was being questioned What's before. What's the basis for us to do that? Well, here there's none. <coughs> I no, must say. No, you've just said it is conceivable. It I'd is conceivable. Tell me the basis on which we can do that. Well, if, the, um, if there is an adjudication like this one, where the evidence is placed on the record, and that record is before the court, the court can certainly examine it to determine whether the uh, proposition was correctly decided. In this case, uh, Justice Kottmeyer specifically said she was reviewing the arbitration <coughs> and did not want to review the substantive record. She, it, she had examined the arbitration instead to find out whether she found it fair and regular under the laws applicable to arbitration. And, and, and there and was a colloquy. And, uh, you, and you're saying that when a superior court judge does that, it nevertheless remains open on appeal for the reviewing court to look at the substantive record? No. I believe what remains uh, on appeal open on appeal is that the reviewing court can say that the, uh, the uh, uh, superior court handled it incorrectly. They should have conducted a hearing and allowed in some fashion the evidence to come before them. So the, we, then the issue is remand? Sure, of course. Because it, clearly we can review without question the decision of the superior court judge, correct? No question. And if, and if this court were to find that a superior court judge on face Fa being faced with an arbitration award like this must conduct a full inquiry, then of course you would direct the Superior Court judge to do it. Um, I do not think this case presents such an opportunity or, or uh, commands it. 
one of the um, if I could, sorry yeah. if I could take you back to Wick for a moment because I'm troubled by this uh, let us assume for the sake of this argument that the MBTA looked at the WIC situation, found it to be clearly disability discrimination, <coughs> had no desire to take it to trial because they assumed they would lose, Yes. wished to settle the case, and believed in good faith that the only fair and complete settlement would be to return Mr. WIC to his seniority rights. Yes. Uh, are you saying that they have to go to trial or that they have to somehow settle and get the matter before a judge for a settlement hearing with notice given to the union and the union being brought in as a as a, uh, a, a intervener what, what what's the procedure by which the MBTA can accomplish that only if the union were to say no when a question arises the okay, well let's, assume, let's assume they've gone to the union and the union <coughs> says no so then what, what are they supposed to do yes I think that the MCAD would have the authority to examine the matter so we have to go back before the Mass Commission Against Discrimination where the, the union hasn't made a claim of discrimination. Who's the complainant? How does the MCAD get jurisdiction over this? I, the MBTA does not have the authority to bypass the processes of collective bargaining and impact fellow employees I, I understand, Mr. unless Taylor. there is a finding. Now, if they want to do it in advance of a finding, even before probable cause is determined, if the MBTA gets a, a complaint and it comes across their I, desk. I, underst I understand your point. Is I understand. You, I really do understand your point on you need a finding, otherwise you've got to involve the union. The follow-up question is, if the union says no, who do we go to? If the union says no, in, uh, there are several avenues for the employer to act to sort of bring the union to heel. Yes. One would be arbitration. But the arbitrator says there wasn't a finding. Didn't ha this, no, no. In the absence of the finding, union doesn't, I mean, the union might have had negotiations, just said, we don't agree with you about the disability. No, there are several ways that it could occur. One is to go to the auspices of the MCAD, which includes a mediation provision. They'll and who would go? Cases. Pardon me? Who would go? The union would have to be represented. No, who would go? You have to initiate, I mean, of course there's mediation, but you have to initiate a complaint. The MCAD doesn't have jurisdiction just to mediate. Right. All right, let's, let's assume there has been no MCAD complaint. No, there's, the been, no, there's been an MCAD complaint, and, the, and there's a settlement with the individual, with Mr. Wick. Right. Right? Even before finding a probable cause. And so the, the um, employer, MVTA, and Mr. Wick fi file a dismissal with prejudice. If the dismissal includes terms, which affect other employees in the workplace in, the, in a competitive bidding situation, at some point, the union has to have been involved. What, what I believe that is that it would be the law, because the MBTA cannot unilaterally change terms and conditions of, employee, of employment for other people. But what you're saying should, should happen in this situation is before they actually sign the dotted line and make that settlement final, th they need to, you would say, they need to involve the union, and if the union refuses to go along with the proposed settlement, then they need to continue the MCAD process. Or they have the alternative. Is the answer to that question yes? The, I, the I'm answer I'm is I'm no. So, I'm sorry if you don't appreciate the question. No, the answer is no, because they have other alternatives. The, the management and union can test matters all the time in the arbitration, <coughs> their own administrative procedure. In this case, the arbitrators were reviewing grievances that had been brought up by employees contesting what the employer had already done. Can but I the MBT Act, MBTA Act provides for arbitration of substantive disputes between the parties. That so is another avenue that the employer could use. So the answer, as I understand it, Mr. Taylor, that you would give is the following. If the MBTA is faced with a complaint and the MBTA does its own investigations and concludes that, that without a question of doubt in its employer's mind that if this goes to trial, if this goes to trial, they will lose. If they lose, they run the risk of attorney's fees, punitive damages, and all kinds of other things. They have made that conclusion, a good faith determination. That's right. If they want to settle, and presumably the, the settlement will, in a case like WIC, and it is not at all unusual, it's going to affect seniority rights. If they go to the union, and the union says, we don't agree with you. The only recourse they have is to go to arbitration, where the question will not be discrimination. 
No, the question may be discrimination in arbitration. Of course it may. There is a no discrimination clause in the, in the collective bargaining agreement. If the employer believes that it should have relief from a provision of the collective bargaining agreement because it has discriminated, it absolutely may raise that, and that difference between the parties can be resolved substantively on the merits by an arbitrator. The requirement that before they can enter into a settlement agreement, there must be involvement of a third party, in this case a union. In a non-class action suit, what is the, what is the, what, on what case do you rely for that proposition? No, there is no case that presents that question. The, the, because I, I know of no case where there was no finding. There, if there is a civil rights case that advanced through at any level, there has been a finding. And the, this is, and while we all agree that the civil rights laws should trump or override the collective bargaining agreement, the questions that the MBTA is presenting to the court here, either directly or implicitly, are not right for adjudication here. So, so how, They're how not is, justiciable. How is a settlement between the MBTA and, and one of its employees before the MCAD, how is the settlement of that case carried out? Uh, if the settlement is going to affect seniority rights, how is it actually carried out? How is it executed? Well, in this case, the supervisor simply put WIC on a seniority list above 30 some other people. But, but you're saying that there would have to be some additional stage of arbitration between the union and MCAD. Uh, what, I would, don't what would be the subject of that arbitration? I don't think that uh, the subject of the arbitration would be whether, whether or not, whether or not to, to, to execute the settlement? No, how to, how to accommodate the settlement and the interests they, of they fellow couldn't, employees. Uh, acor according to you, there would be a substantive uh, arbitration. But according to you, they couldn't even execute the settlement without involving the union. Not make it binding on the union. No, to be binding on the union, the, it, it, and if they represented that, w one of the, uh, one of the, uh, um, uh, a prior arbitrator in, in an accident case where the union contested uh, a settlement and said, look, the, the guy wasn't at fault in the accident. We want to litigate that. The arbitrator said, look, the MBTA was bargaining with rights it didn't possess. I understand. The, the, the employees have a right to say whether the, the accident was uh, at fault or not, and the, whether you. the operator was at fault or not. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. You're SJC 10280, adoption of RICO.